welcome to this week's Monument Monday and we're here in beautiful Kilkelogue townland in Mullig Moor and with Joe McGowan who's the local historian here and this is Joe's land and Joe's going to tell us about some of the really interesting features that we've got here. Um, tell us Joe, tell me a bit about the background to the, this particular area. Well Tamlin, you're very welcome to Mullig Moor, I'm delighted to have you and to um, have this little known place documented because it is a very historical place and people walk around enjoying the sights and the sea and the sounds of the sea and the birds singing and so on, a lovely sunny day like today. But they pass by so many interesting things that are embedded in the landscape and that you really have to pause uh, for a while and know the fields intimately through a lifetime of experience. Yeah. Um, uh, we're doing this video right on the base of a signal tower. Yep. That's for a start. Um, as we look out here, we're looking across at St. John's Point and Schlieve League. This is Donegal Bay. We're looking out over a promontory fort right beside us. So that's just in this one spot alone, a promontory fort and signal towers. Um, if we continue on around, we see a lookout post that was used during the Second World War, sitting up on the hill. This area then, Joe, was quite strategic, you know, going right back into prehistoric times with the promontory fort here um, and then right through to the use of the signal tower here in the 19th century. Can you tell me why was the signal tower built or what was the purpose? The signal towers were built um, all along the coast from the Pigeon House in Dublin right around to Mallon Head because after um, 1798, when the French landed at Killala, and 1803 Emmett's Rebellion, and they were constantly at war with the French at that time. They, they, as you might say, the West Coast was a soft underbelly. There was no communication at the time. So they decided to build a series, 81, of those signal towers and Martello towers, which we don't have here, but the signal towers we do have. So they built them to keep an eye out on the bay in case of invasion by the French or by any other hostile at the time. So, as you say, this was a very strategic location. In Sligo, the first one was down at Caramabli, near Drummer West. Uh, the next one was uh, in Maharau. The next one in Strija, And then this one here. Yes. Which was a remarkable structure at the time. Yeah. Signals were sent then from this tower here, across the bay, to um, St. John's Point. That was the next point. And so on, all around the coast, by a system of signals. Beside the, the, the signal tower, which was just over 40, 40 feet high, 43 feet high, there was a, um, a mast. The mast itself was 50 feet high, and they had a system of balls and hoops on that. And with those balls and hoops, they sent signals from one place to another. So these Martello towers, are, are the signal towers, were also defensive in the sense that they were um, garrisoned by sea fencibles. And the sea fencible district extended from Ballyshannon down to uh, uh, Killala, down in that direction. The, in this area, they would have had uh, three captains and four lieutenants and a company of officers. They had four gunboats uh, with cannon and mortars on them. So it was uh, defensive, but also it relayed any information if a ship that wasn't recognised was coming in here, whether or not uh, she was flying French colours or American colours, it would be reported uh, in minutes actually from here all the way around to Dublin. So it was really quite state of the art the way they were able to signal it, from it, one it tower to the other. Yeah. Because this would be pre Morse code, it would be pre semaphore, it would be pre telegraph, it would be pre all of that sort of thing. It would be the first um, um, mass communication. Um, by a clumsy structures now, we would say in this day and age, but at that time it, it was a cutting edge technology, shall we say. So you can really see the signal tower here now and the Joe standing on, in the foundations there in the base of it. And there's a few stones still around it and we can kind of get the, the sense of the, the tower that once was in these high um, foundations here. And Joe, you have a wonderful uh, reconstruction drawing of what it would have looked like. And can you tell me, Describe for me 
where we are now in this. Well, I'm standing, we're standing right in the middle of where the signal tower was. Yeah. Uh, it's quite overgrown at the moment, but if the growth was cleared away, you would see the foundation stone still here. 14 feet by 14 feet square. 14, 14, 14, yeah, 14. Yeah. So that, that's all that's left of it. And this painting was done this, as a this, reconstruction? Uh, I did a talk there uh, about uh, six months or maybe more than that. I, and I decided, you know, people go by here, I go by here, and we have no idea what the thing looked like. So I got together with my friend, Anna McLone. She's a fantastic lady. And as you can see, very talented with the brushes and the canvas. So we got together a collaboration and uh, I got the images and she had the brushes and the talent. So this, this is, is what great. we came together with. So um, this is what the signal tower would have looked like. One of the features, we're probably not going to be able to get into the mall, but one of the features was this ladder. There, were, there was no entrance on the ground. So if the signal tower was attacked, um, the, the people would not be able to get in because when they came up and into the building here, they drew the ladder up after them. Now, these are called bartisans and maculations. Uh, I was afraid I wouldn't remember that. <laughs> The, there were a, an easier name to remember is that they were called murder holes yes. for a very good reason. Uh, they were used, of course, for observation, but you can see that any enemy that was trying to attack and come in here, you couldn't burn the place because uh -huh. there was nothing to burn. They, they would fire down their hot oil. You can be sure that the, the remains of the pole that they had under the bunk beds or whatever would get emptied as well. Rocks, yeah. stones, burning tar, it, uh, they were very easy to defend. Brilliant. So that, that's a major feature. And quite now, difficult to undermine as well. With, you know, the foundations look quite... Um, the the quite foundations were deep. Yeah. And again, uh, excavation will show exactly what they were. Yeah. We're here now looking at the promontory fort, Joe. And tell us, what have we got? Um, behind you. Well, what we have behind us here is a perfect example of a promontory fort. It was a defensive position. When all else failed, the armies or the people or whoever wanted shelter uh, retreated. This was the last point of retreat. Uh, as you can see, it was very easy to defend. On two sides, it was impregnable. So all that had to be defended was uh, this side here. Behind me, you can see the banks, the typical banks of promontory forts, uh, this would have been much higher. Um, there would be a palisade on top of it, a stockade, uh, timber structures perhaps, which would have made this very high. This uh, outer line of defence would have been formidable in, on its own. But when an attacking group or army or company scaled this wall, they went down into a trench. So then they could be attacked from the second defensive position over here which also would have been much higher. It would have been stoned, speared, slashed, and uh, it would be practically impossible to come across this first line of defense and the second line of defense to get at the people inside. So it, it was highly defensible and very effective in protecting the people. And we have a number of these promontory forts around Mullig Moor and around Sligo's coastline. And the cliffs, as you say, were part of the defensive element. So these were perfect places to position a fort of this kind. Perfect. The landscape lent it. And we can imagine also uh, that this would have been much bigger going back. Uh, promontory forts, I'm not sure of the dates myself, but certainly there would have been early Iron Age and it would still have been used uh, into the Middle Ages, uh, say 15th century, 16th century. I can't be too sure about that. But you can see that it could be even earlier than Iron, Iron Age. But what makes more sense? than to retreat to an easily de defensible position like this. Yeah. It would have been much bigger at the time and uh, it would have contained more people and perhaps buildings, shelters on there as well. But until we have an excavation, we're not going to know anything more about it. Now, I don't know if excavations on promontory force have probably been carried out in other parts of Ireland. And uh, it's been... It would be an interesting one here, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 But it, it lends itself, to again, to the whole story of this area, how you've got all those different defensive elements right through from prehistory right up into the 19th century when you've got your, your signal tower at the spot. So it's a really strategic location here. It was a strategic location. And being a peninsula, 
and there's, there are so many stories associated with this I could keep you here, here for, for the rest of the day until the sun would start to set but then we might have a nice sunset so that might not be a bad thing either but we can see other features in the landscape which would lend us to believe that there were other lines of defence out here. Yeah. We know from stories that was told in Cromwellian times when the local people were being attacked they withdrew to that big hill. There. This hill behind so us. that would have been another uh, line of defence. This would have been the last line of defence but, but that would have been one. We, so we know that uh, even in Cromwellian times also we know that uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the of the Moneygold ambush and after that the, the, the Black and Tans made several raids. The people of the countryside were in fear and I have it from the old people. A lot of my information comes from the old people of the village and further afield. That's where they spent their time out on the big hill for days and nights afterwards. Really? But this was also true of up along the mountain. So we, we know that, uh, that, that it was a defensive position all through the ages from, from Iron Age times down to the present time. So this would have been a very significant place. Well, it's really interesting and I really appreciate you showing us all these interesting features on your land here. Um, really learned so much about um, coastal history of Mullingmore.